Coming up on DTNS, how bad was that attack on Ukraine's websites? We'll tell you. An important change comes to the Chrome browser, and we look over the new legal revelations regarding Google and Facebook's ad deals. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 14th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just having a good time uh, talking about all of our old tech, uh, some of the old computers we had, whatever tech we had in reach, uh, mobile device-wise. If you want to hear what we had and what we thought about it, get Good Day Internet, the longer version of this show, available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Speaking of that, big thanks to our top patrons. Today they include Kevin, Paul Thiessen, and Ali Sanjabi. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The Russian Federal Security Service, or FSB, announced that it raided the operations of the Revil ransomware organization targeting 14 suspected members. The FSB said the raids were conducted at the request of U.S. authorities. Revil is believed to be behind recent high-profile attacks against Colonial Pipeline, JBS Foods, and U.S. technology firm Kaseya. Block, which you may remember as Square, uh, announced it's developing an open Bitcoin mining system designed to, quote, make mining more distributed and efficient in every way. The system will focus on making buying a mining rig easier, simplifying heat dissipation, and, key, improving power efficiency. Block is evaluating technology and partners for the platform, including possibly developing its own new ASIC. The Electronic Fun Frontier Foundation spotted a new Android 12 option that lets users disable 2G connections to avoid privacy and security problems exploited by cell site simulators. Also known as string rays or IMSI catchers, the devices can masquerade as a cell tower, then make cell phones in their range connect to them and intercept personal data use and information. Although Android users have the option not to allow 2G cellular connections on their devices, the setting is turned on by default, so that's good to know. Also, a phone's modem also needs to support the 1.6 radio HAL. Humble, the Humble Bundle, software bundle service. You, you've heard of it. Uh, it's going to shift to a new $12 a month subscription model for the Humble Bundle subscription on February 1st. And after that date, Humble will require a Windows-only launcher to access Humble Choice, Humble Trove, and Humble Games collections going forward. Users have until the end of the January to download any Mac or Linux versions of games using the existing website. Bloomberg reports that development challenges related to overheating, cameras, and software may delay Apple's AR VR headset reveal. Previously, still rumored, but rumored to happen at WWDC in a few months. The headset reveal reportedly may not, not happen now until the end of the year, possibly later, with the headset going on sale in 2023. All right, let's talk about that Ukrainian attack. Uh, it was on the BBC uh, World Service this morning. It's been all over the place. Uh, if you hadn't heard, Friday morning, about 70 Ukrainian government websites stopped functioning after a massive attack. Uh, many of them were attacked and stopped functioning. Some of them were taken down by the government as a preventative measure, but most of them were attacked. Targets included the websites of the state treasury and the DIA electronic publishing services platform. That's where vaccination certificates and electronic passports are stored. But it doesn't seem like they got to those, just to the website. The deputy head of Ukraine's state agency in charge of special communication and information protection, Viktor Zhora, called it the most powerful attack in four years. That'll make it the most powerful of all time. Because remember, Ukraine had its power grid attacked more than four years ago. He did add that personal data had not been, quote, distorted, important data had not been leaked, and site content had not been damaged. Ukraine's SBU State Security Service said preliminary information indicates that personal data was not leaked, so it, it backs up what the minister was saying, and site content was not changed. Ukraine has not assigned blame for the attacks. That's important diplomatically, I think. Ukraine's not out there pointing the finger to the east, which you might expect them to do. They haven't done that. Messages from the attackers were left in Ukrainian, Russian, and Polish. Toby Lewis, head of threat analysis for Darktrace, told ThreatPost that government sites are, quote, typically built on common software, which explains the domino effect of website shutdowns that we saw. Uh, and it was too early to call it a sophisticated attack. So far, they look like simple defacements. 
In fact, Johan Ulrich, uh, Dean of Research for SANS Technology Institute, told ThreatPost, quote, this may very well be the work of hacktivists emboldened by current propaganda. The defaced websites were only informational and likely did not hold sensitive information. However, Dark Traces Lewis did raise the possibility that sophisticated attacks be happening while these less sophisticated attacks distract everyone. Uh, so it, it may it may be a situation where these 70 websites going down are not the serious part and something else happened. But that's just speculation that it could be used for that. That doesn't mean we have any evidence that something like that has happened. Uh, so big attack, big splash, lots of headlines, but it doesn't seem to be that serious. It doesn't sound like that there was a lot of damage necessarily done. It seems like technologically. Yeah, we yeah, we we need to go and you know firewall this, block this off and we'll be back up and going by next week. Is what this is was what this kind of sounded like. Um it is just interesting that they were very specific. This is the, you know, but you know, a, a huge attack in the last four years because we know that they have had some much more egregious stuff that has happened, uh, taking their power grid down. The, these, as you said, they're yeah. more just vandalism just on public facing government years. websites. Yeah. Uh, it's a, yeah, I, I guess what they're saying is like, man, we had a nice four year break there. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, it, it's interesting that it is being presented as very serious, doesn't seem all that serious, but the possibility that this is a distraction, you know, based on a, a group, many groups, individual, whatever it is, actually doing more damage and uh, skating under the radar a little bit more because this is getting more attention, that could have some legs. Yeah, and even if that's not the case, Technologically, it's not serious. Politically, it is, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I I think that's why it's it's important to note that Ukraine has not blamed Russia. You're going to see Russia blamed in so many headlines and so many stories about this. And I don't know, maybe some Russians did this, maybe or maybe not at the direction of the Russian government. But Ukraine isn't taking the bait for that yet. Uh, and, and the fact that it's in Polish could be misdirection to try to make it seem like, oh, everybody's after Ukraine. Obviously, the point of these attacks, if you look at the messages, is to get people upset, to get people to feel afraid, feel disconcerted, feel threatened, whoever's behind it. And that's where the damage comes. The, the damage comes not from the technology or, you know, personal data being exfiltrated. The damage comes from propaganda purposes, be my opinion. That and the fact that... Uh just from a PR standpoint, it just doesn't look good when a government website is hacked and goes down. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. All right, we so, got some uh, we got some news about Chrome. Rob, tell us about this. Absolutely. So Google wants to prevent Chrome from being used as a beachhead for accessing routers and other sensitive devices inside of private networks, but wants to make sure that it doesn't break the internet by doing so. In a spec known as private network access, Google's uh, Chrome will start requiring public websites to get explicit permission from browsers before accessing internal network resources. This will help prevent cross-site request forgery or CSRF. A CSRF was used back in 2014 to change DNS server settings on more than 300,000 wireless routers. I actually remember that. That was a it, it was a huge deal. I don't think it happened to anybody that I knew or anywhere where I worked, but that was that was a pretty big deal when routers were going not down, but they were changing where you were being sent to. Um, it was used to redirect browsing to malicious dummy sites that looked legitimate, like fake google.com that could steal your data. Up until now, unless a router or printer locked off the browser somehow, the default would be to allow the browser to access any resource on the network. With private network access, such requests will only be allowed if the device on the other end explicitly allows it. Starting in Chrome 98, Pre a pre-flight request will be sent to the device, but a final connection will not be prevented. However, a warning will be logged in the DevTools issues panel. This is done to let legitimate sites test how their system will work. Starting around Chrome 101, um, it will be mandatory for public sites to have explicit permission before they can access endpoints behind the browser. So when, when I read this, actually I threw this story in a rundown. and. Um, I, I guess it's better late than never. Um, that, that thing that happened back in 2014, it was huge. It was all over the news. I'm sure you guys probably talked about it here. Um, it, 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 it was a big deal because it was like not so much big companies that were being taken down, but it was like the mom and 
pop shots who had folks who were whoever knew the most about computers kind of set up the you know their router with the high end router they could get from Best Buy or mm -hmm. Micro Center or Fry's or something like that. And this is where you know the, these are the devices that were being attacked. So as we said, you know you think you're going to Google, but you're actually going to some spoofed site that where they're getting your personal data, um, or you think you you know you're a school and you think you're going to one site and you're not. You're going somewhere else. Um, it, it was a big deal. So I was kind of shocked that it took Google this long to actually, you know, fix this in, in their browser because every, you know, I would say legitimate or every respectable uh, endpoint devices inside of a network, they basically have had to put things in place to mitigate this. Some, some of them don't even allow you to connect directly through a website. You've got to use an app sometimes now, depending on the device. So, um, you know, Google fixed it. But did they really fix it is, is my question and I'm asking because it's like, you know, who is this still affecting? Yeah, I was thinking about this. Um, and and I feel like the reason this ever you, you might even wonder, like, why was it ever like this? Uh, the reason it was like this is I remember when that router uh, breach happened, everybody reported on it uh, as this is why it's important to update your router firmware because the router should have been locked off. They didn't point to the browser because the reason browsers were not seen as important is how many devices did you have on a home network? We're not talking about enterprise networks here, right? We're talking about a home network, printer and a router and your computer, maybe a couple others, right. maybe a phone, right? So it was easy to lock those off and not worry about the browser and leaving the browser able to reach endpoints made it so that it was a lot easier for sites to do legitimate things without having to put in extra code and extra work. What has changed since then, uh, since the early days of browsers, is we have so many more devices on our network and Internet IoT. of Things is yeah. making it exponentially more to right. the point where it'd be irresponsible for Chrome to allow endpoints to be accessed that way because that means your doorbell, your alarm, your locks, your TVs, your you know, like it's crazy. So I don't know that that answers your question of why it took so long because it's not like Internet of Things just showed up this year. Uh, but it does, ex it does explain to me like why it wasn't shut off in the first place and why it it took a, some moment for people to go, oh, conditions have changed. we got to change that. Well, back in December of 2020, the attorneys general of several U.S. states led by Texas filed an antitrust lawsuit against Google. That filing was updated in November 2021, but heavily redacted. A New York, a New York judge then ruled that additional details could be made public and the case was refiled Friday. So let's talk about this suit. In the newly public portions of the suit, the attorneys general alleged that Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg would be meta at this point, but it was Facebook at the time, and Google CEO Sundar Pichai approved the Jedi Blue deal in November of 2018 that gave Facebook an advantage in Google's online advertising auctions. Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg allegedly negotiated that deal. You may have heard of Jedi Blue. We've talked about it on the show before. It's an agreement allegedly gave Facebook an incentive to use Google's advertising exchange. Google allegedly guaranteed Facebook would win a certain number of auctions when using the program. A little bit of a handshake deal here. And the two companies connected software to speed up the delivery of ad tracking data between the two systems when Facebook did use Google's ex exchange. There were also detailed allegations about three other programs called Project Bernanke, Reserve Price Optimization, and Dynamic Revenue Share. The suit alleges that Project Bernanke charged advertisers a higher bid price than it paid publishers, and then used the difference to boost the bids of other advertisers to ensure that they'd win an auction that they otherwise would not have won. Another version directed these funds to publishers if they gave Google preferential access to ad inventory. Google says that the project was made to increase competition and make ads more effective. That's what it would say. As for the other two newly revealed projects, the reserve price optimization program set a minimum price for advertisers based on previous bids. Dynamic revenue share changed the fee that Google took in order to help advertisers use Google's tool to win more auctions in Google's other tools. Google said that the program helped publishers maximize ad sales. Also something it would say. Both companies denied that Jedi Blue is an illegal deal at all, and Google called the lawsuit full of inaccuracies. Google spokesperson Peter Schottenfelds said that the company will move to dismiss the case next week as baseless and lacking legal merits. He also denied that Pachai approved the Jedi Blue deal at all. 
Uh, yeah. So Jedi Blue, I have always felt, is doesn't sound that controversial. Uh, big companies often make uh, big deals with each deals. other to say like, hey, uh, you give me a little access to your thing. I'll give you a little access to my thing. Uh, I get why it's worth scrutiny to say, you know, these two dominate the ad market. But the deal itself on the face of it doesn't sound that unusual or illegal to me. So I'll, I'll buy the fact that Facebook and Google might be able to, or Google, because they're the only ones subject to the lawsuit, would be able to prove in court that this deal is not illegal. Project Bernanke, the reserve price optimization, the dynamic revenue share, on the one hand, you could look at those and say, okay, this is just like a loyalty program for customers. Like, oh, if you, if you do this, we'll we'll help, mm -hmm. you know, make sure uh, that you, you get a little boost from us. We'll help you out. We'll give you some bonus points in the bids, which is fine unless you also run the auction house, right? Because mm -hmm. now, you're, now you're fixing the price for the person who's using your other tool. Remember, Google owns every part of the chain. They own the bidding, they own the placement, they, you know, they, they own the whole thing. So they can say, we're going to help out people who use our tool for bidding to beat out people who are using other tools for bidding in our auction house means we get to keep more of the money. That starts to smell to me a little more like antitrust. Yeah, they're absolutely picking winners, um, you know, in this. I mean, if you're using our stuff, we're going to hook you up. If you're using other stuff, which is completely fine, you're not going to get the hookup and you may have been charged mm -hmm. more. Um, that just doesn't look good, Google. It just it just doesn't look good. Well, and I mean, the idea of, you know, loyalty programs, you know, it, me as a consumer, if this was something that, you know, either I was working with Facebook or Google directly on, not even in a business sense, but just a, oh, well, if you do this, then you get these fun perks. We're all very used to that. But two companies of this size having some, you know, uh, backroom deals, uh, it, yeah, I mean, it, it it may not end up being an antitrust issue, but it definitely seems that way. Like, imagine if Google was an auction house, right? And you walk in and they're like, you can use any paddle you want. But if you buy a paddle from us, the auction house people, you uh, might we will win. add $100 to every one of your bids <laughs> automatically. You're going you're, you're gonna to buy the paddle you're not going to get the paddle from the other makers, right? It's You're not gonna just get the that, but yeah. they're overcharging the other bidders to give you the hundred dollars. Yeah, so yeah. they're making the money oh, every yeah. day. We're getting the hundred dollars <laughs> from the other bidders, by the way. But you don't need to worry about that. That's a whole separate thing. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's going to be an interesting one. I I have I've been more bullish on the federal case than the the states one uh, until this, and I'm like, okay, there's a lot of things in here I don't think are going to pass muster in court. But uh, let's see, let's see if Google can defend that one. Uh, hey, I'm really excited. This weekend is the kickoff of the Scientists in Tech series. Dr. Nikki Ackermans uh, will be uh, chatting with different scientists, a different scientist every week, about what they do in the world of technology, where science and tech intersect. You can find that in your DTNS feed this weekend. I got some bipartisan news for you. U.S. legislators across the political parties are supporting a bill called, wait for it, Terms of Service, Labeling, Design, and Readability Act. That's T-L-D-R, the T-L-D-R Act. This bill would require websites to give a summary statement at the top of the Terms of Service that you could read before you opt into the entire Terms of Service. That would include an estimate on how long it would take you to read the complete Terms of Service, uh, details of any sensitive data types the site collects, guidance on what of that sensitive data is required for the service to function, as well as methods for you to delete your sensitive data later. In addition to summarizing the terms in, in non-legal language, it would also disclose any data breaches from the past three years in that summary. So human-readable, machine-readable also, language at the top to say, this is what our terms say, and here's some other details that you might want to know. The bill would exempt smaller websites from this. Uh, it would be targeted at larger websites and be enforced by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, as well as the state's attorney general, uh, who could seek civil actions for breaches of the act. I'm glad to see that this is truly a bipartisan uh, you know, deal here. And it, it just makes sense. I, I understand that we're all supposed to read those very, very long legalese type TOS. I, I, I get that we're supposed to, 
but people generally don't. Um, and one of the things that government is supposed to do is make our lives better, make things better for, you know, constituents. And this goes, I think, a, a little way to help with that. It's, it's how long is it going to take to read this? You know, you know, it's the Cliff Notes version of the of the super long TOS that I think in many cases are written to be, you know, as vague and ambiguous as possible, just so you don't really know what you are giving up, what you are agreeing to, what you are agreeing not to do. I mean, as somebody who has skipped many terms of services, just like, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, like, I, it's not that I don't care. I do care, but it's just not going to happen. Not going to read this whole thing. And I just hope that there's not something hidden in there that I didn't know about. Um, I, I appreciate this. I, I, I think that, you know, for a lot of folks, it's not that people don't care about legalities. It's just that the way that it's presented is so hard to digest. You just end up going, eh, well, the company isn't really going to screw me over, right? But that doesn't always happen. Yeah, my gut re reaction is to agree with y'all that it would be nice to have some of this data up at the top, especially data breaches and all that sort of thing. Uh, there's a lot of open room in this bill for who gets to write the summary, which is the company in question, how they get to write the summary. Uh, the FTC is the judge of whether the summary meets the the criteria or not. And, and as we know, heads of FTC change with every administration. Uh, so those things make me a little unsettled. The other thing that makes me less excited about this is you still have a yes or no acceptance. When you get that summary and you read it, if you read it, you still have to say, okay, if you want to keep using the site. Like it's it's not like you can you can negotiate here, so mm -hmm. I wonder just how many people are going to even pay attention to the summary because it's not just about how long those EULAs are. It's about the fact they're like, well, I kind of have no choice if I want to use yeah. this thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could just not install this program, and that's fine. But maybe it's a program that all your friends are using, or you know, family members, or that sort of thing. Yeah, this is not going to work if it's Instagram or. Mm -hmm. You know, WhatsApp Messenger, you, you're going to just install and start using those tools. Yeah. Eulalizer is a is a plugin out, out there that's pretty good at, at uh, alerting you at that stuff. I'm not sure that this means I don't need Eulalizer anymore. All right. Netflix tried to sneak in some news on the weekend before, before we, we think we wouldn't notice, but we noticed, didn't we, Rob? We absolutely did. Uh, Netflix announced it will raise prices on its Canadian and U.S. plans. Netflix standard plan um, with two streams goes up $1.50 to $15.49. The 4K plan goes up $2 to $20 a month. And the basic plan, which it doesn't have HD, goes up $1 to $10 a month. The new prices are in effect now for subscribers. Existing subscribers will get an email in 30 days before the other price increase affects them. And this will roll out gradually. This last domestic price increase for Netflix was in October of 2020. So it's now, been a yeah. little over a year. Was was the 2020 increase the $14.99? Because that's what yeah. I always think of Netflix as, $14.99. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Um, so, yeah. So it hasn't even really been that long. And that seemed, uh, I don't know. I mean, this, this is the sort of thing where it's like, they're not huge increases. But for anybody who's, who's you know, making sure that they're uh, taking, taking, um, taking stock of all of the cord cutting options that they have, and many of us have five, six different options, uh, this is, you know, it's, it's not great. If you like Netflix originals, and of course they're back library, then maybe this doesn't matter too much to you, but um, it might be harder for them to onboard new folks. Well, they've hit saturation in the domestic market. Uh, they don't have as much room to grow, so they don't need to fuel new subscribers as much as monetize Keep them. them. Yeah. yeah. Right. So my advice to folks is don't get mad, unsubscribe. Unless yep. it's worth it. To or you. stay if subscribed. It's worth it, stay subscribed. Yeah. Yeah. My gut tells me people are going to complain, but they're mm -hmm. probably not going to go out and cancel uh, their Netflix subscriptions in mass. Clearly not beyond the point that, well, we're charging folks on average a dollar 75 cent more. We're going to make more money by doing that than the number of people who actually drop off. Yeah. I think the, the cable companies. companies, though, they're kind of saying, yeah, uh, OK, well, Netflix, you did it. Hulu, can you go ahead and raise yours up? And how about, you know, Amazon, can you raise, you know, raise Prime up? You know, can, you know, can everybody raise your price up? Because the cable companies are trying to slide back in and say, hey, we could just give you cable again for one price and you get all that stuff you get on those other platforms. So yeah, yeah. and I've even, I've, it's I've even heard rumblings. 
you know, from people saying, you know, the cable subscriptions sometimes don't look so bad, but it all depends on what you want to watch. I also think that Netflix, you know, this is just, this is just my take. Uh, the time of year, it's cold. People are indoors. Uh, the pandemic, you know, it's, it's unsafe out there. People are indoors. This is a good time to do something like this because you're going to have less complainers. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think the cable companies want you to pay them for the Netflix subscription all in one bill is what they're hoping. So maybe they can just get you back for all of it. Mm. Well, researchers at Northwestern University developed something called FaceBit, an open source project de described as Fitbit for the face. FaceBit is a sensor that's designed to attach to an N95 face mask, able to monitor respiratory and heart rate, and also check if a mask is fitted correctly. Maybe you're not wearing it quite right in your face and you could do better. The mask is designed for medical workers, could be designed for anybody, but certainly for frontline type, type folks, works up to 11 days on a charge. It will need further clinical trials before proceeding, so this is not something that you can just go up and buy right this second, but it also has been open sourced, so if you're interested, could be kind of something to build upon. Yeah. You can DIY it. I mean, these are scientists, definitely not marketers, because it's just a chip that sits in front of your face. It's not. It, it, it doesn't have a, ni a nice design look. Also, they called it face bit, which is you know probably not the best way to market it out there because it <laughs> sounds like my face just got bit. Uh, but if you get past that, uh, well, it, something between Facebook and Fitbit. It, yeah, know. it's great. It's great technology. Uh, it's good stuff. I like. I it. was actually kind of a, as a Fitbit user and a, a loyalist, you know, with their software, you know, to kind of track all sorts of stuff for myself. I was like, wow, fit for the face. That's not really what this is. <laughs> this is something that, you know, a mask wearer can get some more information yeah. about health and safety, and that's pretty much it. But it's still cool. Yeah, and very good for healthcare workers because fit is important. You want to know if it got knocked out of place and you didn't realize it. And, and you know, ongoing monitoring of like, hey, you're, you may be starting to show some some signs of, of, of something. You might want to go get that PCR test uh, uh, right now, which is good you too. Know, I'm wearing a mask while I'm working out in the gym now. This mm -hmm. would actually be kind of cool for that to kind of yeah, you know, just yeah. give me some different numbers than than I'm getting off of the other trackers that, I'm, that I've got connected to my body. So, yeah, Indeed. I'm for this if they can get it small enough and, and inexpensive enough to make it yeah. make sense. All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Jeremy, who said you talked about the average price in cars being higher than before for new and used cars based on Kelly Blue Book numbers. I've heard that a lot, but no one seems to say why that's happening. If there is a limited number of chips, it makes sense to build vehicles with the best, read highest, price options. So even the normal vehicles aren't the ones that dealers would have advertised at low prices to get people in the door, but the ones that got sold when a customer figured out what the inexpensive vehicle had for features. So I responded to Jeremy about this because... Uh, Supply and demand could be enough to explain it, right? There's there's a low supply and there's people who really need a car and that's going to drive a price up. Uh, but it's a fair point. It's a fair point that uh, if I have a low supply and I'm a, an auto manufacturer or a car dealer, I might want to make that supply be the most expensive supply it has so that I can, I can get a few extra dollars out of it. Wouldn't put that past automobile companies. They're used to making ginormous amounts of money so anything they can do to make a little bit more you know i wouldn't i wouldn't put them past them especially so. with sales down like if sales were at the normal price uh companies car dealerships would be losing money but they're not because they're able to sell it for higher and then matt writes in i've listened to dtns for a few years now and i'm always hunting for those nuggets that put concepts into focus for the average user but i don't usually expect to find real life lessons on a tech podcast that is until yesterday uh dtns episode 4190 on the topic of monetization of wordle you tom Merritt, said you don't have to be rich to not be desperate <laughs> <laughs> uh, not sure if that's your original, but it is absolutely true and an indispensable life principle that will be passed along to my kids and fingers crossed to many other people in their lives. Like it or not, the attribution will always go to Tom Merritt. Uh, well, I'm not sure I felt like I was making sense when I said it, but I'm glad you found wisdom in it, Matt. Thank you. Oh, yeah. A good reminder to all of us uh, who 
identify as not rich. You know, you don't, you, you could still not be desperate. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. It's possible. You know, you just, you have your convictions, <laughs> you know, stick with them. And that's, that's what makes you, you. Reading it back makes me feel like Yogi Berra, but I don't know. Maybe it's worth more. Than that. <laughs> well, we, well, we, uh, we, we love the responses from everybody who emails us all the time. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to keep those emails coming. Thank you so much to everybody who does give us feedback every day and ideas for future shows. All those good things. We also have a brand new boss to thank, and that boss's name is Chris Hutt. Chris just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Chris. Oh. We love to we love to get a new boss, and we've we've had a nice long run of streak of them. So thank you, Chris, for keeping the streak alive. You rock. You do rock. Uh, you know who else rocks? Rob Dunwood. Rob Dunwood, you rock our socks. I don't know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's always nice to have you on the show. It's fun to have you on a Friday in particular because we're all looking forward to the weekend. But we have a lot of news to take care of, and you do a lot of other stuff as well. Yeah, so always thanks for having me. And uh, for anybody who wants to follow me, I am at Rod Dunwood on all the things. And I got a couple other podcasts. Head over to smrpodcast.com or thetechjohn.com, and you can listen to me babble on about tech, um, you know, for a couple more hours each week. Yeah, good good uh, rundown of the CES stuff on the Tech John this week, among other things. Appreciate that. Well, we are live on this show Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That is 2130 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Put it on your calendar. If you can join us live, we'd love to have you. Speaking of Monday through Friday, we are off this Monday for MLK Day here in the U.S., but we'll be back on Tuesday to talk about the technical and economic hurdles of implementing the metaverse with Jonathan Strickland. Have a great weekend, everybody. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S1, BioCow, Captain Gipper, Jack Shit, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show included Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Rob Dunwood. Guests on this week's show included Blair Bazdrich and Tim Stevens. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>